Eaters. Walk through some of the different floor plans. Some of it will pertain to some of it won't. Right, Elvis? Some of the vans, I'm going to do all the different floor plans so we can see all the different models, but a lot of the things are basic, okay? Okay. First thing we're going to talk about is the fresh water system. This is called the potable water system. Potable water means that you're sucking it out of the holding tank, which you have inside the unit, and it's going to your toilet, sink, and the various other water items. It goes into the gray water or black water tank, and we'll get to that later. Here's where you're going to fill your water tank, and all the models, this is where it is. So is what you're going to do is you're going to open the little cap here, pull this little orange cover out, you're going to stick your water hose, which is a patented water hose that you'll get from an RV dealer. Uh, I'm sorry, an RV supply place, and it's a water hose, a high-pressure water hose so that you don't have the flavor of a hose, and you can have the pressure there all the time. You'll stick the hose in here, turn the water on, and just let it fill up till it runs out. Okay? What we're going to talk about is the forced air heater. Inside, there's a thermostat control, just like at home, and you'll turn it on there. This is where the air will intake and heat up, and then it will also exhaust. Uh, the, right next to it is the hot water heater. Inside is also a switch. This is an automatic igniter. You do not come out with a match and light it. The only thing that's inside of here is a reset button. So if you do have trouble igniting it, you'll undo the little tab and open this up, pull it out, and right in here you'll see a little button that says a reset. You'll push that button in and then go inside and try to reignite the uh, the uh, a uh, hot water heater and then you should have no problem, okay? There's a vent up at the top for your air conditioner. Now this vent allows the air to flow in. What you don't want to do when you wash it is to take a hose and to squirt the water directly into there. This will cause water to get into the air conditioning and it could get into the cabinetry. You'll want it to sort of cascade off like the rain does when you're rinsing it and then you should have no problem, all right? Out of the van, the driver's side. Uh, first of all, your fuel tank, remove the cap. Normally, you're gonna use regular unleaded fuel. Now, you can use super if you're going into a mountainous area. It's gonna give you a little bit better uh, octane level and you're gonna get a little bit more power. The tires, the tires should all be filled at 70 pounds all the way around if you've got the new van. Now, if you do have an older van, you want to look because 45 pounds is the pressure that you would want to put on the older vans that have a 41 PSI tire. So you're going to want to inflate those all the way to the max. Here is the, air, here is the rear venting for the refrigerator. So you've got the grill up here and the grill down here. Now, what happens is the air flows through so that when the refrigerator is running on propane, it has a ventilation ability. There's nothing in here for servicing for you. If they do need service, this is where the servicemen would open it up and work on the unit. Um, up in here, in the new ones, now if you have a 1995 or newer, you're going to have the running boards that have the storage compartment. So what you're going to do is lift it up, and in here you got a little bracket that you'll pull up. You got the 25 foot 30 amp power cord. This is a 30 amp adapter. So in order to plug into an adapter that would fit into a house current such as a garage, you're going to need to get a 15 amp adapter uh, so that you can plug it on and then be able to plug into an outlet. I recommend that you buy a 25 foot extension cord that's a 30 foot 30 amp circuit also so that if you're plugged into somebody's house at, at the garage or something like that, you need this big cord to enable you to run the air conditioner. Now if you're just going to run the microwave or you're just going to charge your battery, you should also have a 100 foot uh, regular orange extension cord in there. This way you can get the, the ability to, to get electricity inside. Let's talk about the components that are in the side also. If you open the little compartment right here, this is where you would put your 
TV cable running if you're in an RV park and you want to hook up to their satellite dish or their cable TV. Now all the units come standard with a built-in antenna in, built into the headliner. This would be if you are in an RV park and want to use those other facilities. This is the city water connection. If you're stopped and you're going to stay a couple days and you want to take a three-hour shower, is what you're going to do is undo the little cap right here. You'll take the water hose that you have, yeah. you slide it in under here, and attach it on. This will be your city water connection. Okay? This will allow power from the water, pressure from the water to run the shower, the toilet, the sink. Otherwise, you would be turning on your water pump. You have an outside shower, so if you want to take a walk on the beach and rinse your feet off, if you have a pad, if you want to give them a bath, there's also a light up at the front up here. You flip it on, that way at night you can be, you can be in there. Now, I want to get back to the city water connection here for a minute. When you're running on city water, there is a valve right here on the new models. Now, this is only on the new models, 1995 or newer, that have this. But there's a valve that you have to open so that it goes with the flow of the water, so that when you're on city water, the water comes up through here and flows through your system. If this valve is open, then it will not suck water through your holding tank through the water pump because it's going to be sucking air out this vent right here. So make sure that after you use this city water connection that you do turn the valve to off. Now it also can be inadvertently hit with the power cord while you're bringing it out. So if for some reason your water pump is on and you can hear it sucking, you can hear the noise going brrrr, but there's nothing coming out, then it could mean that this valve has been left open. Earlier I talked about the adapters. These are some of the adapters. You can get the little one here that would just plug right in, or you would get the cord here if you wanted some adjusting. Okay? This is the, something that you might want to carry, of course, jumper tape. And this is the water hose. So, very, very important that you get one of these brass water pressure regulator so that the water pressure when you're hooked into city water doesn't blow the seal out in the toilet. If you don't have this, you can blow the seals out in the toilet or even explode your fresh water lines inside. So make sure you get this, hook it onto the front of the hose that attaches to the faucet, put a piece of electrical tape around there so you know it always stays on there and it'll never come off. talk about the propane system. Now initially is what you want to do with the propane system is that you want to use it the safest possible. There are shortcuts to use, but I'm going to tell you the safe way. The safe way is, is that you turn the system on and off each time you use it. This way you're not ever going to have any problems. Uh, if you want to extend it and make it a little easier during the rain or the cold, then of course you can turn it off, but make sh turn it on. I'm sorry, and leave it on. But make sure that you get a propane leak test at least twice a year. This will ensure the integrity of the propane system, so that not only it's not leaking, but also that any of the appliances aren't leaking all either. So down here is your propane system on the 19th step, and it's going to allow you access into the propane tank. The propane tank is down here. The newer propane tanks on the 95 or newer are six gallons. You have the gauge that's right over here on the corner that tells you how much propane that you have. Of course, you can only fill them 80%. Don't worry about it. The guy that's filling it at the station, he'll only be able to fill it 80% also. You do not fill this. Here is the on-off valve. So turning it all the way to the right or following it as the little arrow on here shows you to close will close the system off and shut propane off to your unit. By turning it to the left or towards the open arrow, you'll open the propane tank and this will allow propane to flow in so you can work your appliances. Over here, you're gonna have the handles that pull your sewage gray and black water gate valves on the other side. On this one, the handles are right in under here. First thing you're gonna do when you wanna dump your sewage is to undo the little garden cap here Move the hasp over to the side and pull the assembly out. Inside of the running board here, you have this elbow. 
and that's what it's for here. So you're going to take the end cap off. You got the little tabs here. You're going to line them up and lock them into place and put this into the sewage dump hole. Then you're going to come over and first you're going to pull the top handle, which is the black water or toilet tank. Grab a hold of the handle and pull it towards you. When you open the gate valve, the sewage will start running through. You're going to want the sewage all to run through. And if you want, you can rinse it inside by sticking a hose in or running the water. Then you'll close the valve. Okay? Then you'll reach down here and pull the gray water handle. This will allow the gray water, which is the sink and shower waste, to come through. And also, it will allow the valleys that develop in here to clean the sewage out by the gray water, soapy water. Once it's done, you'll close both of the handles, take the little cap off here, and as you can see, you're going to have a little bit of stuff that's going to seep out. Let's pretend the hole is here. This is just fresh water, but imagine if it was sewage. So you want to go to Save On or Thrifty and buy a bag of latex gloves. Even Home Depot sells them. This way you can keep them inside of here. When you're done, you throw them away. Once you're done with this, you're going to take this off, rinse this all off. You're going to take the cap here. And you're going to put the cap back on. Now, it's very important that when you put the cap on, that this little screw and this end cap piece are on the same side because the hasp is over here and it all lines up. You could put it on backwards, which would mean the thing would be on this side, and the little hasp wouldn't hold it on. So make sure you have it right. Make sure that it's all, the whole assembly is put back together tight or else you could, it could fall out and be lost. This right here is sandpaper, any sand, any blacktop, any cement. So when your hose is stretched all the way across, you don't want to drag it across. That's sandpaper. This is a very thin plastic, and you'll create a hole in here, and you'll get leaks. So pick it up and move it over here, and then just put it right inside, just like that. Okay? Push the little cap over, close it off. That's all there is to dump in your sewage. Then you would get your chemical, add it into the toilet, a little bit into the sink, and you're ready to go again. Cut. If you get a generator in a 95, I'm sorry, a 96 or newer model, the generator is in underneath the divan. The spare tires have gone in under there since 1996, and as what would happen is the spare tire would come out from under there and it would be mounted on a Continental kit on the back of the door. So underneath the, here is the generator. Inside, you have the switch that turns it on and off that has the hour gauge. So if you do want to come out here and check the oil, you do have to lay down and pull the little cover off and check the oil and put it all back together. Make sure you don't lower the unit into a lake or a river. It's not really designed for that complete submersion. Otherwise, running over water or rain is not going to hurt it. It's fairly uh, waterproof as far as that goes, okay? If you've got a model that's older than 1995 or older, then it's what they used to do is put the generator in under the rear dinette area. So there's a little doorway on the outside that you're going to open up, and this is how you would get access, like I was saying earlier, to inspect the interior. Lift these little tabs up and let the unit drop. You'll see that out here it does have a start switch. So you can push it and try to start it, or you can stop it. You have a filter here and an air filter here. And then this is just like a lawnmower. You undo this little cap, wipe off the little dipstick, and then just stick it right in. Don't twist it all the way into the bottom. Just stick it in and then measure how much oil is in it. Then put the thing in and then turn it all the way tight when you're finished. The oil should be changed, Onan recommends, every 100 hours. Since it doesn't have an oil filter, personally, I recommend every 50, hour, 50 hours or once a year. The air filter is 150 hours or every couple of years. Okay, so that's, that would be all that there is in the generator. Now, as we move up front here, 
This is the way they used to have them, the flat running boards. Now, you may have a fiberglass running board if you're in a 1990 model or newer. Anything previous to that would be aluminum, but a lot of this is going to be the same. Same refrigerator vent with the ventilation. Now, all you do is turn these little tabs right here. This little doorway will open up. Just right past the propane tank. There's a little bar that was pulled out. Tip it up, and this is going to hold the door up so you can use it. Down here, you have the same cable TV connection in the other model that we have. The city water connection, your power cord, and the propane tank. They all work the same. There's just a little bit different configuration of them. The biggest thing is when you go to dump your sewage. Right about here where this side is, it's going to be unseen unless you get down on your back and look underneath. Because what you're going to be doing is reaching in underneath, and you're going to be doing the same procedure as we did over there. You're going to undo the little cap. You're going to undo the hasp. And you're going to pull the entire assembly out. Just like the other one. You're going to take the cap off. You're going to put the little end piece on. Then you're going to walk to the other side. Cut. around to the other side. And is what you're going to do is you're going to look for the split in the doors here. So you're either going to feel in underneath or you're going to get down the first few times until you realize where they are and what they feel like. And you're going to reach in underneath here. Now, just like in the other model, I told you it's always the, the toilet water first. So you're going to reach in under here and you're going to feel a big black plastic handle. You're going to pull it towards you. All the sewage will run out of the tank through the hose just like it should. You'll close that valve and then over to the left you'll feel a steel rod. The steel rod is also connected to a big plastic handle that's more underneath the center of the van. That goes to the gray water tank. You're going to pull that. The gray water will run through, washing out your sewage hose. When you're done, you push it closed at chemicals, just like before, so you're ready to go. All righty? When you walk up in and you want to get into the hood area, you're going to reach down to the right side in the newer models and pull the hood latch. On the older models, it's on the left side where the brake release is also. You'll uh, pull the handle right in over here on the right side. You're going to reach in and there's a little latch that you're going to pull on. So there's a bar here. This is the little latch right here. So you're pushing the latch over. Now, some of them are tight and release the arm. There's a little hole right down here above the light that it goes into, and that'll hold the hood up. This is for air conditioning. There's a handle down in here for the transmission fluid. So you'll pull it out with the engine warm. You'll check the transmission fluid. If you're going to add fluid, this is where you add it also. This is where you check the engine oil. Of course, the engine is going to be off, let the oil settle, and then you'll check it. If you have to add oil, you'll add oil right here. Right behind here, there's a little cap that you'd undo, and there's two white containers. One is for the radiator fluid, so you're going to add coolant, engine coolant to that if it needs it. The other is for the windshield wipers. This is where you'd put the fluid for windshield wipers. This is a very easy. The battery right here. It's got a little eye on the newer ones. It's a maintenance-free battery, so you do not need to check the water level in it. You just let it go. Now, if you are going to leave the unit parked for a month or so, the batteries will drain from the clock. So the best thing to do is like we do here, disconnect the negative side. Okay, you just need a little half-inch wrench to do that. Now, there are nice switches that you can buy and install that would make it a little easier. It'll run you about $35 to $40 for the knife switches, and I'm sure everybody's got a pair of pliers or a half-inch wrench, and so it's pretty much free to do that. When you go to close the engine compartment, is what you're going to do is put the latch up here, let it stand about a foot above, and drop it. If you just lay it down and push on it, not only are you getting it dirty, but you could dent it, and it usually doesn't catch anyway. So this way it catches every time, and it's not going to hurt any of the mechanisms. OK, we're going to talk about the awning. Inside in the toilet area, right next to the toilet, you're going to find this little rod right here. It has a hook. That's what goes up into the little eye right here. Put the hook in, and then you'll see that it has a 
a uh, uh, handle on either end. Uh, this one spins, so flip it down so you'll be able to turn it. Pull it downward so you're creating a downward pressure, otherwise this thing flops around and will flop out. Start turning your awning, bring it out about a foot. Okay, once the awning is out about a foot, you're going to reach inside of here and there's a couple of knobs right into this area. Loosen the knobs. It's got an elbow. Bend the elbow out. Okay. And then pull the, pull the, of course I get one that's stuck. Loosen the knob, pull the elbow out. Usually they're a lot easier than that. Raise it up, tighten a little knob. Do the same thing for the other side. Now you'll be extending your awning out. And the awning will come out. The arms will scissor outward. You see how nice it is. As it's moving, you will want to adjust the feet. They come out also. Now those arms that you see under there scissoring out will not ever straighten out completely. They'll come out and they'll still be at an angle and that's to increase the strength of them. As it comes all the way out, when you get to the end, the awning will sort of fluff down. See how it fluffed down there? So it's at its most extreme point. So roll it back in just a little bit till the awning is taut. Now you've got a nice taut awning. You can sit under here with shade. Remembering that in the bottom of these little feet, you have some holes. There's some stakes inside of the accessory drawer. If you're in a grass area, you're gonna stick these little stakes in at an angle on either way to hold them in. The best thing is to get an awning tie-down strap. It's a corkscrew, big corkscrew, that screws into the ground and has a strap that goes over it with a corkscrew over there. In the afternoon, the wind is going to come up. This is a sail. When this goes up and over your motorhome, this $700 on, $50 awning is now going to cost $600 to repair. So it's really important. Now, if you're on blacktop, they do have these little feet along the side here. So what you're going to do is lift them up, extend your foot out a little longer, okay? And then put the bottom in first, latching the top down, up, 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 up. And of course, you should have tightened your little knob first. You see what happens if you don't. Now it's on a blacktop area. You can have the awning up with stability. But still, you want to watch it. In the afternoon, you don't want to leave this thing out. But when you start taking it down, it's going to be just the reverse. You're going to wind this thing in, and uh, you're going to be able to put the legs in, OK? So we'll wind it in. You can even get a little drill, even. about a foot again so that you can see. Okay? Here again. Undo your arm, slide it up. Straight up. Remember this is an elbow, so it flexes and goes in and out. Put it in, fold it in. Put it in. So the little foot right here is going behind a bracket that's in there and locking into place. Then go back, turn the little handle so when you open it the next time the awning don't, legs don't flop out. And then close. Now, if you look really close, zoom in up here. If you look really close, as it closes, there's two little red tabs. Say hello. 
There's two little red pads, one at this end and one at that end. So as the awning starts closing, you see how the little red pad comes out? You want to make sure that they disappear and that means that it's locked. Then just remove your stick and that's it. We talked about most of the things that were on the outside of the vehicle. We're going to start about the inside now. We're going to start from the rear of the van and go forward and just cover things. I know it's out of the manual order, but it makes it easier for me to do it, to film it, and this is the way I do it when I do my talk through. First of all, you got your screen on your awning window. Of course, these will open and pop out, and then you zip these. You'll zip these down. Now, it's what you don't want to do when these windows are closed. These little handles will stretch the material on here. And then you'll create a gap for mosquitoes to get in. That defeats the whole purpose. So subdue yourself. Try to leave them straight up so that these always stay straight. You don't even want them halfway or they start bending. All the way up, they'll remain straight. Then when you use them with the window opening, you'll have a nice mosquito proofing. The cup holders, of course, flip them down, flip them up. This is called the rear dinette of a versatile model. So it's the two couches facing one another with the rectangular table in the center. They have the storage compartments by opening the doors right here on either side. So you can get to the storage and underneath. You can seat four back here. It's got the swing arm type TV stand. You can have seat belts added back here and carry passengers if you want. Kellen. We're going to talk about how you make the bed, the dinette, into a bed. You're going to remove any ornamentation that you have. Basically, is what you're going to do is to take the table and wiggle it back and forth. You want it to release from the feet. You take and store the feet in under the storage areas. Lift up the two sides and place the table down into the middle. Move the one cushion inward and grab the other one in the middle and just sort of tilt it down. It falls right down. Give yourself some room to work. Do the same thing with this side. It goes right down. Now is what you're going to do is to put these two cushions together. The table will be in between the feet that are on the bottom here, which also locks your dinette in. So if it's tough, you can sort of pressure them down, or you can lift them like this and put the middles together, and they'll fall down together. Now you have your full-size bed, or double bed. This is the swing arm for the TV stand, like I had mentioned. You swing this out. Watch the TV in the front, swing it back, the TV would be in the rear. Cut. You're going to be plugging in your TV. You have the 110 outlet, the 12 volt outlet. So most people get an AC, DC type TV so you can run on the battery. Then you have what is called an antenna, which is your built in antenna into the headliner. And then the cable TV connection, which is in the outside running board when you're in an RV park. You would run the cable to the back of the TV. This is a carbon monoxide detector. It will detect carbon monoxide in the air. Basically, the carbon monoxide detector up here and the propane gas leak detector, which is underneath, that I'll show you in just a minute, they should be left disconnected when this is being used as an everyday car. Fluctuations in power or reading of, of faults uh, or emissions from an old truck or old car next to you can be picked up and they start going off and you're in the front, you can't do nothing about them. So disconnect them, and then when you're stopped in your park, that's when you want to connect them. And excuse me, <laughs> you want to disconnect them and use them. Okay, cut. When you're cold, you want to turn the forced air heater. So just like at home, it works just the same way. You got the forced air heater thermostat control up here. The top of it is the setting for the value of the temperature you want the heat to be. So when you're igniting it, you will push it all the way towards the wall or up to 90 degrees. This little dial will tell you how hot it is inside right now. This is the on-off switch. Push it towards the wall. It'll click. In a second or so, you'll hear the fan come on from the heater underneath. 
where I'm sitting, and I'll show you that also in a minute. It'll start putting out warm air. When it starts getting warm, you'll set the thermostat for 75, 80 degrees, whatever you want, and it'll come on and off during the night or day so that it keeps the temperature very nice. The vans do have an R17 rating for insulation, so it will hold the temperature in fairly well. When you turn it off, you're going to take and push the knob all the way down to cold and flip this off. That's the proper procedure. The fan will continue to run for two minutes while it's getting the emissions and the heat out of it, then it will automatically shut down. The new models, as you can see over here, have a little Kleenex dispenser. In order to change it, lift up on it and it'll drop right out. You can put a new insert in. Okay. We're now going to be talking about the air conditioning. When it's hot like I am now, you love to turn it on. You do have to have electricity, so that means your power cord that's outside will be plugged into 110 electric at an RV park, or you'll have the extension cord that we talked about earlier, and you'll be in somebody's driveway, and you'll have the air running if you have the big heavy cord. Otherwise, you would have an auxiliary optional generator. This would run off the fuel tank of the van using about a half a gallon an hour. You turn on the generator, let it run for a couple of minutes, let it get warm, then you turn the air on. There's a little doorway that's right up here that you're going to open to get access to the controls. You have a vent control that's up here that's open or closed. Basically, you want to leave it closed. There's a little flap in the back that bugs just get in and dust comes in. You really don't want the air from out there in. You want to recirculate. You have three control settings up at the top with off in the middle, high fan, low fan. Then you have your air conditioning settings down here, low, medium, high, cool. So thermostat control setting down here. So normally is what you're going to do is you're going to turn the thermostat all the way up to its highest number, turn the air on low, cool, let it run for a second, then flip it up to medium and high. You're going to let it run. If it gets too cold in here, then you're going to turn this knob down a little bit, or you're going to turn it from super cool to medium cool, and then adjust the thermostat. You have a little bit of adjustment here with this little switch. Not much, but it will allow air to come and flow through. The cabinets all have the buttons that are in the bottom that you'll push in and lift up. So no matter what cabinet it is, no matter where it is, it's this kind of a latch. Inside, I've given you a couple screwdrivers, and you'll see that this part of the latch is the part that you adjust when the cabinet starts rattling. So if you don't have a nice tight fit like that, then it's because this has moved over a period of usage. Loosen it a little bit, adjust it, tighten one side, close it. When you get it right, tighten both sides. Same with all of the cabinets throughout. The galley has a microwave which is pretty straightforward. It has a carousel in it, electricity or 110 power, here again, generator or plug-in. This is the fan exhaust for over the stove. So if I can move some of my accessories here, you have a two burner stove, you push the knob down and turn it, and then you use an igniter or a long match or a long lighter. This way it can ignite it do each one. Do the back one first and then the front one. That way you don't burn yourself. One turn of the switch will allow the fan to come on. The next turn will turn the fan off and turn the light on. The third turn will turn the light and the fan on. And it does exhaust outside. And you can remove these little grills under here and clean them. So it's pretty easy to do. As can you remove these screws here and lift this up so that you can uh, remove the screws here and lift this up so that you can clean in underneath. Now the galley sink, the new ones, have this new insert in. So normally it's a regular sink. Then if you want to use it as your bathroom, you have this new insert that you can put in and makes it feel a little, a little more like a bathroom. If you like it, fine. If you don't like it, leave it at home. Another option here is the cutting board. The cutting board's nice to have on here because the water will always drip a little bit. It has a groove that runs around and catches it, and then, of course, allows it to go back into the sink. 
Um, when you're using the water and you're using the hot water from the from the uh, from the tank, is what you're going to want to do is you're going to be using your water heater. Now, because the water shakes around and the gases get released inside there from the heating and shaking, there is a pressure that's built up. So when you turn on the faucet to the hot water, you'll find sometimes it'll go sploosh, sploosh, and just sploosh all over the place and splash, making a big giant mess. You can get a little adapter that will allow one of those little swivel things with the uh, rainfall type screening on it. That'll at least contain it a little bit more. You're never really going to get rid of that splooshing because, like I say, the water is sitting into your hot water heater, which is right under here, and it's uh, splashing around from your driving, heating up, and causing the gas gas bubbles to expand. So there again, it's going out. Okay? I did forget about talking about the underneath of this as I moved into the galley, so let's step back just a little bit. When you remove the cushions, you can see it's a little bit easier to see inside of here. Underneath this storage compartment, you do have half of this area for storage, and the other half right here has the hot water heater in it. The big blue things down here are the speakers for the stereo, front and rear speakers. Right here is your forced air heating unit. So the heat is coming out of here with the thermostat just above. Now over here on this side is your power converter. This is where by opening the doors you can get access to the power control panel. You have the 110 breaker switches when you're plugged into electricity. These will be on allowing electricity to flow into the different outlets and appliances and you also have a, uh, a battery charger so when you're plugged into electricity or your generator is running the conversion battery which is the secondary battery back here is being charged now like i say back here in the corner if you lift up the flap of the carpeting in the very corner you're going to see a little doorway access with some screws in it you got to remove those screws, and inside there is your conversion battery. So it is, on the new models, a maintenance-free battery. Now, if you've got an older model, your battery would be in under the lounge seat, which is behind the driver's seat. You'd have to lift the lounge seat up and then remove that same panel. Um, we've talked about this stuff. Let's put this back into a dinette. Basically, the thing that you want to remember is it's a dinette, is that the backrests have to be firm and against each side. In each of the corners, there's a little block of wood. So the backrest is going to sit on that angle so that it creates an angle like this, not straight up and down. So pull your center cushions out, pull these out a little bit, and just flip them straight up and push them back on either side. Now, like I said earlier, you have these little feet that are at the bottom of the of the uh, cushion bases is what they are is they're to lock in the seat base so that when you're sitting in them and going around corners driving they're not sliding all over the place basically is what you want to do is just put them up there okay then get in and either push it with your hand over using your leg or using both legs just push outward and you see how they fit into each tight and they're nice and snug Grab your post holes, put them in, pick the table up, once you get them in, grab it in the center and wiggle it back and forth, pushing downward on it, and it will stay nice and firm. Get any little condiments that you want up, and away you go. In the newer models, the fantastic fan up here became a standard feature. So if you don't have one, don't worry about it. If you do have one, is what you're going to do is open the doorway, which will allow the unit to be turned on. Turn the temperature gauge all the way to cold. Turn it on one, two, or three, and it will allow the fan to come on, sucking the air through the vehicle if the windows are open. Closing it will stop it automatically. The privacy doors, by opening up the doors, you see that there's these little latches right here. You're going to undo the latch, and this will allow you to open your privacy doors, creating the privacy for your bathroom on either side. When you're using the handles, you'll lift up and pull out. That's how the handles are used. So when I close it off, 
I have complete privacy in here. This side of the closet is the, I mean, sorry, this side of the cabinet is the closet, and right down here you see the toilet. Now, the toilet operates via your water pump or water pressure on the outside, which is city water. The one foot pedal here, by pushing it down, will allow water to come into the bowl. So the thing is, remember, you have a 12 gallon tank. The more liquids you put into the unit, keep that yes, down here. The more liquids that you put into the unit, the faster you're gonna fill your tank up. So if you're taking a pee, just take a pee, because when you step on here, it will not only open the door, but allow water to rinse the bowl out. If you're going to take a poop, that's when you're going to let water in to fill up the bowl so it don't stick to the side. This is where you add your chemicals also. So the chemicals each time after you dump would go directly into the toilet and also put some into the sink because the gray water smells also. You see how the handle here for your awning, I told you earlier that it's stored here. This is where it goes. Now, if you're taking a shower, is what you're going to be doing is releasing the little straps inside of here and pulling the curtain out. The curtain will come out and go around you completely. So you pull it all the way out. Now before you start, you want to make sure your towel and your shaving utensils, uh, shampoo and all that is sitting on top of the toilet because the slot where they open is going to be right here which is also where your shower head is. So the shower head can sit right here and be in the shower, okay? Or you can remove it, shower yourself. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna pull the thing all the way around you and there's little Velcro pieces on either side. You're gonna pull it around and Velcro them together. Is what's happening is the water is hitting on me, splashing off of me, splashing onto the curtain, running down the curtain, going into the floor drain. It's not getting your cabinets or anything wet. This door can, as you see, be shut, but it's easier if it's open blocking it. That way when you open the curtain and you're standing here all naked, you're not giving a free show. Of course, you can close the curtains around the vehicle so that nobody can look in also. This way you can come out of the bathroom and change. When you're done, is what you want to do is you're going to dry your hair you're going to dry your shoulders, then you're going to start drying the inside of the curtain. You're going to dry the rest of you and dry the inside of the curtain. Dry your feet and dry the inside of the curtain. Drop the towel on the floor, unless you're using another towel for it to dry the floor. Then put the curtain all the way back in, okay? And is what you want to do is remove that, is put the curtain in so that it's hanging draped open hanging straight up and down inside of here so that when the doors are closed, this is inside but loose so that it can dry. If it's a cold day, turn the heater on and get it warm in here and it'll help evaporate. If it's a hot day, turn the fan on up here, it'll help evaporate. Once it's dry, then you can put it back, bunch it together, and there's a couple of straps inside of here. You wrap around it and strap it on, okay? Now we're going to talk about the refrigerator and the galley. Refrigerator right here, there's a little latch that you'd open and close it. This one would open up. You have your racks in here, uh, the freezer area. The basic thing is that the operation down here. On one side here, it shows you gas and electric operation. It has a schematic that shows you what these things are. So there's a fuel selector. So if it's turned, it says electric, E-L-E-C, off, gas, off 12V. So when you're lighting it on gas, you're going to turn the thermostat all the way up. You're going to turn it on gas here. This is the window you're looking into. You're going to allow gas to move into the chamber by pushing this button in, and then you're going to push the clicker until you see a flame. Now, you have to be out here a little ways. Putting your head right up next to it isn't. It's a mirror that reflects back, so get at the right angle. Don't get too far. Right there, look in it, you'll see it. It's sort of yellowish in the beginning and then it will turn bluish. If you were to turn it to the off position, it would immediately extinguish, turning it to a battery or electric. When you use the refrigerator, you should be using it 
the proper use of it is when you're driving because the engine is charging the battery you should be driving it with it on battery but remember as soon as you stop there's only three hours worth of use on the battery before the refrigerator will kill it if you kill your battery in three hours it will take you 24 hours to charge up not a right around the block 24 hours of plug-in time to get a full charge back so when you stop in the parking lot to rest or to have lunch go down there and flip it to propane when you're in an RV park and your electrical cord is out and plugged into electricity flip it to electric if you want the convenience of not having to flip it on and off you can put it on gas and leave it on gas Remember, though, that when you're refueling the vehicle, you should turn it off. The main valve on the outside turns off the entire propane system. The fueling station is right over there. That way you're not going to have any problem. When you're done fueling, then you turn your main propane back on, come back in here, and turn it on. If you do this type of method, you should consider getting a propane leak test, which is going to test the integrity of the whole entire propane system for leaks at least twice a year. Uh, between $25 and $65, depending on where you're going, but it's worth your life. Okay? Now, we've been in the versatile model, and I've showed you the 190 versatile model so far. We're going to jump into the 190 popular model. A lot, Everything that we've talked about, as far as the outside of the vans, have been the same. Now, the bed area and the toilet area is a little bit different, so we're going to talk about it. The reason that you bought the versatile model was because of the four chairs you've put up with the double bed you can fit in it. The reason you bought this one is because you want these twin or the king bed. Now in the new popular model you have the dividing nightstand here so that if you're sitting back here you can see that somewhere under my feet here is a post hole. So down here is a post hole so you can stick the post in and up under the cushion over here is where the table is stored. So you're going to pull the table out and you're going to set it up here as a dining area. So you could sit back here. If you're using it as a twin bed, then is what you're going to do is you're going to remove these big cushions and you're going to leave these at home. That way you can leave your bed made up all the time. All right? And you may want to bring the small ones with you, though, so this way, if you and your husband are in here and you want a backrest because you want to sit back here because it has a gorgeous view, then you could still sit back here. As you can see, the cushion goes all the way towards the wall and these little wood things would flop down when it's making into the bed. You would pull it a couple inches away from the wall because you're not going to fall in that little crack. It gives you more room to maneuver around. You do the same thing to this side. Uh, the nightstand separating you. Now underneath, if you look down underneath, you'll see that it's a little bit different in that they have these drawers that now open. So you push the little handle in and pull it open, and you have these nice drawers that open for storage. Okay? You still have all the same components as far as power control and all of the other systems underneath. It's just a little bit different in storage. We're going to make the twin bed into a king bed now. Now, if you have an older model, this will not be in here. It's 1996 that these came out. Just lift them up from the front and they'll pull right out. Okay. Basically is what you're going to do, and I'm going to make it a little easier for you to see. I'm going to eliminate the cushion right here for now on the side so that you can see the procedure, and you do have to pull these out. So this is something that you're going to do at home, and you're going to leave it like this in most cases. This is what it looks like with all the cushions out. There's a part that you flip over here, and then the table makes up the other area. So you move the table over, and let it sit down on the slot, your fingers out of the way, and this gives you the stability. Now in 1996 is what they did is they used to have wood, a half inch sheet of plywood on the bottom of these. And so as what happened is it made the cushions too heavy. So this sort of came about to make the cushions lighter. Basically is what you're going to do is the little cushions 
will be along the side walls and the big cushions will be in the center of the bed. So take your little cushion and push them down there in those corners. This cushion right next to it. That way at the cracks you're not on these little cushions, you're on the big cushions is what you're really going to be on. Oops. And there is a difference. This side of the bed is longer. This is a 6'3 bed, and this is a 6'1 bed. So these are the cushions that are longer or shorter. So make sure you get them right if they don't fit, OK? Then you're going to take the bed. You're going to push it over on either side, the cushions. Lift them up so that they make your A. Let the cushions come down together and scrunch the bed together. Okay? All right. Yeah, of course, they're going to wrestle with me. Usually, they go right down. Now you have a 6-1 wide by 6-3 long king. Your head would be at this end going forward. Now, the nightstand that's here in the newer models if you're making it into a king bed, it's in the way. So either you're going to leave it in your bedroom at home, or you could fit it in underneath the storage compartment in the back and having the advantage of having drawers for your storage for something personal or small. So you'd either do one of the two options. Now we're going to talk about the TV in this one. You've seen the swing arm stand in the other model. And in the popular model, you've got a large cabinet here with a roll top. The roll top comes up exposing your TV area. The TV would be in here when you're in the living room and you want to watch it. You pull the whole tray out. This swivels around so that the TV would be facing in the front. If you're laying in the bed, you'd swivel it around the other way. Pushing it in locks it. You also have a little cutting board that's a little bit extra on this one. Uh, in both the models, I did forget to mention that since 1997, if you open the drawer now, and you feel in underneath here, you could have a little hidden extension for your cabinet. So it would be in the side that's not, that doesn't have the stove. The side that has the stove does not do this. It's the other side. Now, the, the bathroom is also a little different. In order to use the privacy on this side, the door does have to be down. And is what you're going to be doing is opening this doorway here opening the little tab up here which would open the privacy door and then you have a little tab down here that would go into the groove. Now I already have the cloth hanging off the bottom but as you can see it velcros on. So you can take it on and off each time or leave it on. The door is designed to close with it on or off. So if we took it off then you just close the door and you see that now it's not draped down it has a clean cabinetry look. If you had it on, then it would be like we started off with. And the door would close in the same manner. You just have the curtain hanging down and you wouldn't have to put it on and off. Now over here by the stove, above the stove is a little hook. And on the side of the door, there's a latch that you open and then this side that you open again and the hook and the eye go together. Okay? So this is the latch that you're opening the doorway with and the opposite one right here. So this one opens the first door, this one opens the second door, and this is how you get your privacy. If you were to look inside of here, it has the same shower feature that goes around you as the other one. You'd stand here in the shower just like the other one. Other than that, it's all the same, except that the seat behind the driver's seat is missing, so you only have the lounge seat that's going by the side cargo door. Now we've talked about the stand-up shower model. We've talked about the popular with the stand-up, but you can also get another option called the tub option. So when you get the tub option, the reason that you're getting it is because you want your toilet usable while you, the shower is on operation, and also because you want to be able to sit down and use the tub. The tub is a little bit more comfortable for taking showers, but it is a little bit more expensive also. Now the way that you use it is by opening the doorway here, and this will open just like in the other ones. Oh, my assistant wants to come in with me. Come on. 
Come on. And be hot. So this one will open up, making your privacy the same way as all the other doors will. As will this one. We'll open up and make privacy straight across. Where the secret comes in is that your wardrobe actually has a little latch that's right here. If I can get it to maneuver over, we'll lock into place when it's in there. You're going to unlock this and your clothes that are hanging up will now swing out over the bed. Let this down, just slide it right over, and you have your tub enclosure. The curtain is over here, you pull the shower curtain around, and it velcros to the edges along here. You have the same handheld type shower head that's going to be able to turn off and on, and the advantage is, is you're going to be sitting. This gives you a big advantage. Yes, this thing is out in the aisle way, but you do want the tub. So when you're closing this all back up, it gives a nice cabinet look. You can sit on it. You can raid the refrigerator. You can watch something cook. It does have its advantages, but you're paying more money for it because you want to be able to take a comfortable shower that you can sit down in in your own unit. Talked about the other models. Now we're moving into the front of the vehicle. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the chairs here and the different things that they will do. First of all, if you look at the bottom of the chairs, whenever you're sitting in a chair, down at the left corner, you're going to see this little bar. By pulling it, you can slide the seat forward and back. The bar here is the release bar. So this bar is the only bar that you'll pull when the seats are forward in their locked position. Otherwise, they swivel freely. Now, there's two things that you can do with this setup and this chair, and three things you can do with this chair. Of course, you can remove these seat cushions completely and put closets in their places on either side. You can also make a chaise lounge or a single bed. So if you're going to make the chaise lounge, is what you're going to do is slide your hand in under the seat and lift it up. Grab the front of it here, lift it up, and pull it forward. Put the seat cushion down, and you've got a chaise lounge. Now you can sit here with your legs up, recline. If you're going to make a bed out of it, the backrest needs to be in the center of the vehicle. And then you'll do the same procedure. That way it's a 5 foot 8 inch, 5 foot 10 inch bed in a 6 foot 7 opening on this side, uh, 6 foot 1 on that side because of the steering column and the steering wheel. Your head would go here, your feet would go that way. You can also remove the cushions, like I mentioned earlier, put them in your garage and put a cabinet or closet in on the other side. Okay, so when you're putting these chairs back in, is what you want to do is to ensure that the seat belt is out of the way and that this little block of wood is up. You're going to slide it in and you're looking for this thing to be flush so it locks down into place. This is the backrest of the new seats. The older seats have a little hook here that you just hook on. Because what you want to do is to slide these little brackets, I'm sorry, slide these little slots down the bracket here. So put it up, straighten it up, and slide it straight down. That easy. That way you have full maneuverability of chairs with the front end option. Um, cut. Now we're going to talk about the monitor panel. The monitor system is up above the lounge seat over here. When you look, you'll see the fire extinguisher. The big thing about it is you want to make sure that the little needle stays in the green. Unclip it right here, and it'll pull right out. Pull the pin, put it at the, th at the fire, and push down. Pretty straightforward fire extinguisher. You're now certified fireman. Over here is the monitor panel. This is a momentary switch, this is an on-off switch, and so is this a momentary switch. The first momentary switch, by pushing it and holding it down, little lights will light up, and they will show you the status of your holding tank. So if the two-thirds were light were lit on fresh, that would mean that if you divided three into the 31-gallon fresh water tank that you have, that you'll know that it's 10, 20, 30 gallons. So you have somewhere, if this light is lit, between 20 and 30 gallons, but you could have 29 gallons before and this wouldn't be lit. It wouldn't light till 30. So it gives you a guesstimation. Holding tank is for toilet, gray water, or sink and shower waste. 
This is the battery side. L is for low, F fair, G good, C charging. The center switch here is an on-off switch as your water pump. Turn it on. The water pump is now pumping and drawing water out of your potable water tank, drawing it up to the sink, the shower, the toilet. Is what you're going to be doing is turning it on. The water will run out. Now, it doesn't hurt to leave this on, but you don't want to leave it on all the time because it draws battery power and it will wear your pump out a little bit faster. The best way to get used to it is to turn it on and off each time you're using it. You want to go to the bathroom, you turn it on. You go to the bathroom, you turn it off. You want to wash your hands later, turn it on, turn it off. The worst thing you could do is to allow your water pump to pump when there's no water in it. So if you do decide you just want to leave it on all the time, which is fine, make sure you have water in your tank because if you hear the pump going brrrr, constantly, it'll wear the diaphragm out. It's $155 to replace it. So it's quite expensive. So make sure you keep that in mind. This switch right here on the new models, 1996 or newer, will have this. And is what it is is a battery disconnect switch. By pushing it on and off, you can turn the conversion battery on and off. So if you left the vehicle stored and you disconnected the front cable like we talked about earlier, flipping this switch would allow you to turn the battery off on the conversion, and when you came back, you would still have a charged battery. The switch below it is the water pump. When you're using the water pump, is what you're going to do is make sure first that there's water in the water hot water heater. Secondly, make sure that the propane tank is on and you do have propane coming in. Then you'd come over here, flip the switch down. This light will come on and stay on from anywhere from 2 to 10 seconds. You want to sit here or stand here and watch this light. Once the light has gone out, you want to make sure that it doesn't come back on. Going out means that it's, it's, it's lighting itself, it's igniting right now. If for some reason it extinguishes, the light will come back on. If it comes back ah. on and stays on, then that's when you go outside and push that little test reset switch out there that we had talked about in the very beginning when we walked around the van. You do not want to drive with your hot water heater on because it will flame out. So the best thing to do is to turn the hot water heater on in the morning, get it hot, it takes about 20 minutes, and then you're going to turn it off, and you're going to have hot water throughout the day. If you're stopped and parked, then you turn the heater on. Do not drive with the hot water heater on. The switch over here on a new van, 1996 or newer, has this switch, and it's a porch light. So on the outside here is a little light, so if you're sitting under your awning or outside, you can turn the light on and be able to see. Okay? the front seats the passenger side swivels right around but this side does require a few more steps in order to turn it around because of the steering wheel the first step that you'll do is tilt the steering wheel tilt all the way up and then the second step is to tilt the backrest forward third would be to put the armrest down on the left side only of course you would want to make sure the seat belt strap along the side of the seat is down then you're going to reach underneath to that release mechanism, and you're going to pull it. And as you're pulling it over there, the seat will turn around completely. When you have it turned around, tilt your steering wheel back down, and then straighten the seat up. This is how you turn the seat around. Uh, this is the only step procedure. It works on the old ones or the new ones, so it doesn't really matter. All righty? talk about one of the last things and that's the controls at the dashboard. Up at the dash here you have steering wheel. The steering wheel has the cruise control on it. So you're going to push the button, turn it on, you got the set button, hit the brakes, you hit the re resume button. If you want to accelerate, hit the excel or the decel button. Over on this side um, is the light switch. Now. When you're stopped and parked, if you turn the light switch all the way to the right and turn it hard till it clicks, it will turn the power off so you can have your doors open without drawing the battery. Right below it is the power mirror joystick. So left, right, up, down will operate the mirror. Take the fingers around the joystick and turn it in a clockwise motion and it'll go to the right side. Turn it to the left side 
in a counterclockwise motion, and it'll make the mirror stick work on the left mirror. Air conditioning, the biggest thing about the air conditioning is this is a van that's got a lot of volume in it. And this is a car air conditioning system. So basically is what you want to do is to put the controls into the center here so that the air creates a circular flow of it going back and coming down without hitting either side of you. Turn it on max and turn the fan all the way up. This will allow the fan to blow out down under here under the passenger foot side is the intake. So it's going to blow out and it's going to suck in down here and you're going to get a nice flow. As it gets cold, flip it down each time. Real easy. AM FM cassette wow. right here, real easy. This thing, if you grab it, lift it up, and pull it out, you can clean it or underneath here if you spill something or it gets dusty. As does the ashtray pull out. So if you need to get your change, you can pull it out. Opening the glove compartment allows you access to the fuse compartment. When you look through the owner's manual, you'll read what the various fuses are for. Cut the camera, turn it off. You who have the new 1998 Dodge chassis, the gas tank has been removed forward and the propane tank into the rear. So now when you open the door, you have your propane tank fill right here. You have an on-off switch right here that turns your propane tank on and off. This is how you activate the tank. Inside in the monitor panel is where you'll read the propane fill level. Okay? You who have the L-shaped lounge, I didn't talk about it earlier, or I talked about the dinette model where the rear has two couches that face one another. This is an L-shaped lounge, so it's couches facing forward with seat belts. Rather than having a swing arm TV stand, it has a roll top that you would pull out. When you're watching the TV in the front, the TV would face forward. You'd spin this around, watching it in bed, laying this way. This also has a cutting board that you can pull out. When you're making the L-shaped lounge bed, you're going to find your table is under here and your post is up in the front in the wardrobe. So when you start making the bed, you're going to pull the cushions out, pull your post out, you have this little cushion that's not used, and it's what's going to happen is the table is going to go across, and then you have this other little funny board right here. This goes across the front. Okay, so when you make your bed up, the big cushion will stay on the side here, and is what happens is you have these other cushions that are shaped like this. You'll notice that they are Velcro together, okay? So it's pretty straightforward as far as, let me get this cushion out of the way. You'll see that you'll open them up, and is what you do is you put the two cushions together. So open this one up also, and you see it also has Velcro inside of it. So the cushions will go together, laying flat. This is the little flap that's at the doorway. It should be at the bottom. So the easiest way to do it is putting this one down first, laying it down there, and then opening this one up and laying it on the top. The headrest cushion, the little cushion that's like this, and this cushion right here are extra. So if you leave your, if you leave it made as a bed all the time, is what you'll want to do is to leave these home. You might want to take this for a pillow when you're relaxing or if you want to sit back here, but this is pretty much in the way. If you're making it up from a dinette to a bed up and down, then it may be a cushion that you're going to need, but it is under the TV here. Nobody's going to sit there. It's only if you wanted to put your feet on it and make it softer. It's the same type of bed. You're going to sleep with your head at this end, your feet going that way. So this person's feet will actually be underneath of the TV cabinet. Other than that, everything else about the L-shaped lounge 190 versatile or the 170 popular 
This is the way that the rear area is also. Everything else about it is the same. Now, if you get into the 170 Popular, of course, you've got the same type doorway opening as you do in the 190 Popular. But because this is a shorter vehicle, there's no rear area curtains. You're going to close the curtains in the back area so that it gives you the privacy. 200 Versatile that has just come out and it's a Class C motorhome, meaning that it only has one side entry doorway. It does not have a rear exit. You go in and out, it's a little taller, it's a little nicer, so you don't have to duck. The refrigerator is on this side rather than the driver's side. Pretty much the same type setup, not really anything that you need to do. Um, this does have an exceptional storage area underneath. By opening the door, you can see that you have the tire in there rather than on the back door. Of course, you can put it on the back. I'm sorry, there is no back door. On the back of the unit, I mean. You can put the tire in here, or you can have a tire set up that would go on the back. If I was to walk to the other side, and you were to look in through here with the camera, look in through there, all the way through. You can see that you could see all the way through. So you can do stuff in and out. Off. On the back of this model, it, the power cord, the shower, and all that setup is inside of here rather than in the running board storage. This is the other side of the compartment. As you can see going all the way, this wooden thing that you see inside of here is the big drawer that's underneath the bed. You still have the same storage area up in the front in the running board with the same kind of a latch. But now, like I said before, all your stuff is located in the back. 15-foot new 1998 Dodge chassis. You will have the LP propane tank va uh, uh, value system on the monitor panel. When you go to fill the propane tank up, you'll lift the license plate up, and in under there is where you'll see the propane fill. So when you pull into a propane fill place, pull all the way to the rear, they'll attach it here. Here again, the generator is in right underneath here with the start switch inside. Okay, model, it's a fixed mattress. So if you look down, it's a coil spring mattress. It does not make up and down into a bed. As the brochure says, it's six foot eight. You sleep with your head at this end, your feet going this way. You have the same type TV cabinet that rolls up. Air conditioning is the same. As I mentioned earlier, you have the drawer that would pull out from the bottom and go underneath. So the refrigerator is now on this side, and it's a four cubic foot. It is larger. It all works the same way, except the controls are on the top rather than on the bottom. The closet has been moved over here. The privacy door, as you see, opens up. You pull the same tabs. They open up and go across. And that's how you'd make your privacy inside of here. This is where the table will store rather than under the seat now. The galley is exactly the same. The bathroom is a little bit bigger. Uh, because this is, vehicle is a foot longer, the bathroom galley area is a little bit bigger. Uh, the door on the 200, there's a latch right over here that you push in. This will open up and it will go straight across giving your privacy as in the other ones. So you can open it like this and go around. The toilet in the bathroom is a pretty much essentially the same, except there's an extra medicine cabinet inside of here. Of course, this is only on a Chevy, as shown in the brochure. So your dash is going to be the front of the Chevy, essentially working the same as the Dodge. Uh, the power controls, steering wheel, the Chevys do not have airbags, so you do not have to worry about it. The new 1998 Dodge has added a passenger airbag, so now you have a passenger and a driver's side airbag. Other than that, the controls are pretty straightforward. I'm not even going to go through them. I hope you enjoy your vehicle that you get from West Coast Motorhomes and the tape that goes along with it so you can learn how to use your vehicle instantly and so you can become an expert at any time whether you've used the appliance recently or you haven't used it for a year or two. Viewing the tape will allow you to do and be able to use it just like a professional. 
Augie and I thank you for your help and your consideration in purchasing a road track, and we hope that if at any time West Coast Motorhomes can help you, please give us a call, and we thank you. The new model is the 200 Popular. Like its sister, the 190 Popular, there's three chairs in the front that will turn around. You can see the front two captain's chairs turned around facing the back. And then there's the lounge seat behind. It has been moved behind the driver's captain's chair in order to get the twin beds. When you come in, you'll notice that the refrigerator is larger. It's the four cubic foot with the galley. It's the same. It's just been flipped so that you can get the big bed in the back. Now, it's made as a king right now. Uh, the measurements on it would be 6'5 by 6'6. Six, six. Of course, you can make the king bed into a twin bed, and you can make the twin bed into the dinette. It has the large opening window, and above you see the air conditioner. Of course, the monitor panel with the generator switch and the privacy doors that would open up that would expose the bathroom area. The curtain hanging off the other side covered there so that when you open that wall, it would become a privacy wall at the rear. The doorway here with the mirror at the front. The toilet area is a little larger, of course and you get an idea of the storage underneath. In this case, the nightstand has been put underneath. Uh, there are drawers underneath, so you can pull it out, or you could put it in under the rear storage or leave it at home. Hope you've enjoyed the show. Once again, the outside of the road track, 200. You can see the new custom wheels that have been added on. This is a newer feature. Uh, very nice, the sewage dump system, of course, the running board storage compartment, and of course, since it's the 200, you have that very large compartment in the rear. Uh, once again, it looks like the other vans. You can see the models, how they all line up going down the road down there, the two 19-footers, then a 17-footer, and the 200 here. Still looking like a van, a little bit wider, a little bit longer to give you the maximum storage that you can get. And then as you can see, the compartment going all the way through to the other side. The spare tire being inside underneath, which you can just barely see if you look over here. I'll go to the other side. Here's your sewage dumps. I'm sorry, here's your uh, outside shower, your electrical, city water, and TV cable. Okay, because the van is at one piece, one solid piece of fiberglass, it's very strong, will never leak, and of course these type of motorhomes that are added to the back of vans do not have rear doors, but it does have, as you see, the air conditioning vent above so you can plug in and get air, and the very large window that you would get in the rear for ventilation. Of course, they always come with a hitch, so you see it down there. But when you open this door and turn your fan on inside up in the power roof vent, you create an exceptional flow of air going through. You can see the side of the vehicle, how it runs down. And we'll walk around to the other side. The spare tire looking through. Down here is the jack. Very nice storage compartment. And of course, when you close the door, it hides it away and becomes invisible. You see the Road Trek 200 popular. The awning up on the top there to allow you to get a nice shaded area or add the Florida, or as we call them out here, the California room. And the new striping. So I hope you enjoyed the 200 popular, uh, the newest floor plan to the Road Trek lineup. Please come out to West Coast Motorhomes and see us so you can see them and all of the vehicles once again.
Okay. Yeah, right now. Yeah. 